Yes, once again, we are back uh, for our subject that is economics. Yesterday, on the first topic, we looked at the background to the economics. Then my colleague handled the introduction to the economics. I already explained the topics we have in economics, there are 15 topics. And we said these topics are covered in a period of two years. So two years we expect to cover 15 topics. And I also emphasized that in senior five, the whole of senior five, that is the first year of A level, we cover the introduction, price theory, production, and national income. That is on the three topics that are covered uh, apart from introduction that is price theory, production and national income so it means that in senior six we have to study 13 topics which is not small work at the same time I said that the first three topics we have to move at a very slow speed why because these are the topics that give the foundation of economics the very starting point where you need to master the concepts of uh, economics you need to understand the theories the principles on which economics runs it means that a student must give time and pay a lot of attention to these three topics because the moment you miss understanding these three topics then you find problems in understanding the certain topics so these are basic topics that need to be handled with the determination with the um, seriousness today we are looking, we are starting on a topic called price theory. Price theory. That is the first, the second topic of economics. The first one is introduction, which my sister is handling. And I go to the second topic in economics, which is Price theory. Price theory is a very, very important topic. You need to pay much attention such that you get to know really how economics operates in an economy. Because if you don't get the real gist of price, that means you will not be able to understand economics. So, we begin by defining what is price theory. We have said it is the basis of economics. If price was not there, if there were no prices, economics would be a very narrow uh, subject. But the presence of price brings in a lot of uh, uh, things that need to operate within the economy. In the introduction, he talked about scarcity, opportunity cost, and choice. All these come in when you have price. You go to the market, you look at the price of commodities. And when you look at the commodity, the price of the commodities, you say, let me take this and leave this one. Because once I take this, I will get more satisfaction at a lower cost. So, here, scarcity automatically is there. Resources are not enough. Because they are not enough, you need to make a choice. And since you have made a choice, there is something that you have foregone. But what has been the basis of this uh, choice, opportunity cost, and also uh, the scarcity is because of the price.
price. Price comes from money. Without money, you cannot have price. The price, when you talk of price, you are talking about money. Whether you are talking about Uganda currents, whether you are talking about uh, you are talking about dollar, it is money that comes first. The moment it comes first, then you bring in the price. So the price of bread is 5,000 shillings. That means that price you are mentioning, you are mentioning it in terms of money. When you say this shirt is five dollars, it means you have talked about money, which is going to bring in price. So, price is a foundation of economics. But price to come in, you must have the currency, which is money, whether dollar, whether yen, whether shilling, that there must be money. So, the evolution of money helped so much to evolve economics. Because now time came that you need to look at the prices of these commodities in terms of money. Not in terms of sacrifice, but in terms of money. And because of that, economics had to start moving. What is price? It is the study of prices in relation to the goods and services that a consumer wishes to buy or would like to buy. So whenever you are studying the prices in relation to the goods and services, that means you are now in price theory. So here we are looking at the prices in relation relation to the goods and services in a particular particular time and particular place. When you are studying the relationship of prices and goods and services, by the way, this moment I have to uh, tell you that when we are talking about economics, in economics, what we call goods and services, we sometimes don't continue mentioning all the time goods and services. So sometimes we use one word. Goods and services are the same as commodities. So you are going to often hear this word. Like in this definition, you can say prices. As the price is the study of prices. A study of prices or study of prices in relation to goods and services in a particular time and particular place. So we can say it is a study of prices in relation to commodities in a particular place in a particular time. So commodities, whenever we mention that word commodities, it is goods and services. Don't make a mistake and say goods and commodities or services and commodities. No, it should be goods and services or commodities. So, whenever we are studying the relationship between the commodities and the prices, we are in what we call price theory. So, the coming of money, as I've said, helped so much to create, to, uh, to develop economics. Economics came in in full gear when money was uh, put in place. Before that one, when we had butter trade, there was little that we would talk about economics. Because a cow against a goat, it doesn't match because evaluation was even very difficult. But here it is a price. That's why you find people are in gardens, 
people are in industries, people are in services. What are they looking for? They are looking for money. And this money, how will they get the money? They will get the money through selling their commodities, which commodities are measured in terms of prices. That is the value. How many cows do you want to get? I want a hundred. How will you get the hundred? I need to work for money. But how much money are you going to work for? It will be determined by the price. That each cow is 10,000. If I have, if I want to have 100 cows, it means the moment I want to have 100 cows, I have to find out the price of each, and each cow is 10,000. That means I have to multiply it by 100, and I say I need uh, 1 million, 1 million shillings to have 100 cows. So the money we are talking about, which you need to buy the cows, is out of the price, the cost of each cow. You need one million. So when you go to work, when you go to look for a job, you are going to work for a hundred uh, cows. But you are not going to get these physical cows that they, they are here, a hundred of them. No. What you are going to do is to get uh, one million go to where they are rearing cows and then you buy the cows at a cost of 10,000 each. You even make a choice, give me this, don't give me this. My one uh, 10,000 is much money, give me that big one, don't give me that. So you are making a choice. This choice you started in the introduction now comes in because of money. You are looking at money the price, then you say, no, I shouldn't take this goat. I should take this one. You say, I'm paying a lot of money. This goat is 5,000. Now you say, I'm paying a lot. I have to take a good one. The choice you are making is depending on the price of that goat, that cow. So price is very important in economics, very important in activities. Everybody wakes up in the morning to go and work. You are in a class. Why are you studying? You are studying to get jobs. Say that when you finish your degree, your diploma, your course, you are going to get employed. The moment you get employed, you are going to start earning. What are you going to earn? Money. How much money are you going to earn? It will depend on the price of the things that you are going to use. The price of food, the price of water, the price of rent, uh, housing, the price of leisure, all those will determine how much you demand as your payment for salary or for the service you are offering. So price is very, very important. It is a key to economics. So whenever you are talking about economics, it's very difficult to go with the price. And that's why this topic becomes very crucial, very important, that whenever you are going to study all these things, international trade, public finance, when you talk of public finance, for example, you're talking about taxes, you're talking about budget, you're talking about to, uh, the borrowing debts. But what are you borrowing? You're borrowing money. Money for what? To buy things for the nation. And why are you demanding this as a tax? So that you can raise enough money to be able to buy. You are looking at the price of the commodities. So it is very, very important in economics. The topic I have to remind you, it is the pricey theory. So, with the price in place, we can know the
consumer behavior. In economics, we are very much concerned with the consumer. In commerce, you call him a customer. That is another terminology you have to know. It, that when it is economics, we say consumer. When it is commerce or accounts, we say customer. Customer is anybody who is buying in commodities. Consumer, for us, we say you are going to use the person who is going to consume these commodities. So, these terminologies, you are going to hear them, commodities, consumers. So, here, consumer behavior. How do you behave? You are an individual. You are called John. You are called Joseph. Now, you as an individual, Joseph, for us, we look at you as a creature created by God. But again, we say, let us watch him and see how he behaves. You mean? The market. How are you going to behave? Because you're going to buy commodities. You get a basket, you go to buy commodities from the market. As you buy these commodities, what will determine how much you buy? What will determine what you buy? Will all be determined by the price. So, price gives you the consumer behavior. That basket, what are you picking, what are you leaving? It is the price. When you go to the market and they say, this bread is this much. Hey, that is much. That is too much. Let us buy oranges. Let us buy this. Oh, I have enough money. And the prices are good. Let us buy this and this and this. Many times we go to these markets, our behavior change. Why are they changing? Because of what we find in the market. You put your own million in your pocket and you move to the shops. You are either happy or you are unhappy. Why are you unhappy? You are unhappy because you, because of the prices. You came knowing that a pair of trousers costs 20,000. You reach the market, it is 40,000. You say, what is this? Your face changes. Why is it changing? price. So, the consumer behavior is determined by or is influenced by the prices he or she finds in the market. So, price theory teaches us the consumer behavior. How you are going to behave in the market. How are you going to respond to the prices? How are you going to buy? You may enter a supermarket and move out with nothing. Not because the supermarket is empty, but the prices you found there are so high. When I find you <coughs> at the door, I ask you, what has happened? I don't see with any commodity. So you know, this place is very expensive. Prices are very high. I fail to pick anything from the supermarket. What made you to behave like that? Prices. So, Price theory is teaching us the consumer behavior. What happens in the market when the consumer gets his money and wants to buy commodities. So it is very important to know that your behavior, how you're going to conduct yourself in the market is determined by the price that you find in the market. For example, if you entered again in a supermarket and you expected to have prices low, I'm going to buy 5 kilograms of maize, 5 kilograms of rice. So you leave, you come out with a budget. You go to the market, you're going to buy these commodities. You reach the market, you expected a kilo of rice to cost 5,000 a kilo of rice. So you expect to buy five kilograms. You reach there, they tell you the kilo of rice is 3,000. You are going to be happy. You are going to change the behavior. Say, oh, give me 10 kilograms. And you are happy. Let us also pick this. You see the consumers are very happy picking things because they found, they found the price.
prices very favorable. So this topic is going to be very important. It's going to be a basis of our economics. And if you don't understand it well at this level, you're going to find problems in all these other topics. We are going to talk about national income. National income, we are looking at the, 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 the total output of a country. But in relation to the prices of commodities, we are going to talk about inflation, money and banking, international trade, public finance, planning. What are you planning? You are planning. Your plans are looking at what people need. After knowing that the people need the schools, they need the hospitals, they need this, you again say, oh, can we afford them? The affordability depends on what? Depends on the prices of the commodities. The prices of cement. Will you have... Uh, do you have uh, drugs in the hospital? What are the prices for medicine? So you, you move away from individual behavior and go to what you call aggregate behavior. How do people behave as a, as a society, as an area, as a country? It is all about price. That's why price theory is very, very important. Now, as we study price theory, as we study we have areas that we are going to emphasize. We have what we call consumers. We have already told, talked about consumer behavior. We are going to look at consumers. What do consumers do? They demand. Every person at one point, has something that he needs to buy for use, for do whatever, is a consumer. So he needs to buy the commodities. So he becomes a consumer and then what he's doing is demand. Then, when you go to producers, when you go to producers, what do they want? They want to produce commodities. They are going to, these producers are going to have to, to do what? To produce the commodities. So we are saying once we are in an economy, we have consumers. The consumer is represented by demand. The demand comes from the one who is going to consume. Then the producer is supposed to bring things that are going to be demanded. So is it a supply we get another part called supply so we have supply and demand now as we start price theory we are going to start with the, the consumer that is the demand in the economy before we look at the supply who supplies we are going to look at that one as well but the demand because you are looking at price theory behavior of the consumer in the market the behavior of the consumer in the market. How is he behaving? This producer is also a consumer because he consumes the raw materials which is going to use to produce. So he's also in the market demanding the raw materials. So we are going to look at what we call demand. It's going to be our next consideration. So what is demand? That is First thing that we are looking going to look at in the uh, in the, within the price theory. What is demand? When you look at demand, we have to define what demand is. What is demand? Demand, in, by definition, we say is the amount of commodities. The amount of commodities. A consumer, don't forget that word, a consumer is willing and able to purchase at a given time in a given place. So we say demand refers, refers to the 
amount of commodities amount of commodities a consumer is willing and able to to buy or sometimes you say to purchase at a given a given price in a given time. Sometimes we also add in the place, but these are most important. So demand. What is demand? It refers to the amount of commodities a consumer is willing and able to buy or to purchase at a given price. Now, this definition that we have given, there's what we call key words. What we call key words are those words that must be there. These words must be there whenever you're making a definition. And uh, as we go on studying, we shall be emphasizing that when you are told to define anything, you are not going to, the whole world is not going to define with this statement. No, this is not a biblical verse. We look at the key words that are in this definition. We look at the key words that are in the definition. Key words that you are going to find in the definition. So, when you are defining the demand, the key words are willing and able to purchase at a given price in a given time. That's what you have to know. The key words in the the key words in the definition. So, you you are free make a definition of your own in your own style as long as the English is correct as long as these underlined parts are out as long as these underlined parts are out and they are clear say so it refers to the amount of commodities a consumer is willing and able to purchase at a given price and a given uh, and a given time in a given time we are going to outline these keywords and explain them well the first one is willingness willingness must be there then there is the word ability then there is a given price Then there is given time. These are very important words which you need to understand very well in this definition. You are willing to do something, to buy something. Your willingness, it is within your heart. I'm willing to part, to spend this money on this, I'm willing. It is from your heart. That is the consumer. You have left the home, you have left the home, you are going to the market. In the market, you find commodities. Are you willing to buy these mangoes? Are you willing to buy this sugar? Are you willing to buy the soap? Are you willing to buy the beer? Are you willing to buy the soda? That willingness. It is what starts. Any consumer to be built begins with the willingness. And in economics, that willingness is very important. Are people willing to buy the milk? Yes, we have got a juice in this trading center. Are people willing to buy the, the juice? That willingness is very important. It's what will determine how much you're going to demand. 
and that is the basis of economics. We economists, that's what we watch. Are these people willing to buy these? There are factors that determine the willingness. But are they willing, given the factors, are they willing, your students, are you willing to buy the books? Yes, they are willing. Because they need them, they need to use them. Okay, we have now calculated the willingness is there. Now the next step, are they able? Can they afford? Now this ability is to, to, uh, looking at the affordability. I'm very much willing, given my status as a student, I'm willing to buy the books. But I'm not able. I'm not able to buy the books. So the ability is very important in determining the demand. You are willing, you are not able. You are not able to buy the commodities. But you have the heart which is willing. So in economics we say he is actually developing into a consumer person. He has the willingness, but he has no ability. That's why we told you that economics is interrelated. When we come to planning for the country, we say people are willing to buy these things, but they are not able. Why are they not able? Government comes in. Low salary. Salary is not enough. So they don't have the ability. They would be willing to buy all this, but they don't have the ability. So, consumer must be willing to buy and must be able. For us in economics to call, call it demand. To come and say there is a high demand for rice. We don't just look what people who are just wishing to have rice. But people who are willing, we are ready. Oh, you are ready to have the rice? Yes, because you must eat. Then we ask ourselves, are they able? Ability. Do they have the incomes? Yes, they are willing. But do they have the, 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 the ability? If you go to, we have different schools. Some schools, you find that the students are rich. They come from rich families. So, they are willing to buy all these eats at school. As the students, they, they are willing to buy the books, the pens and so on, and eats. But the question is, is that school, in that school, are the students able to do they have the ability? In other words, do they have the money to buy this, to, to, to effect their willingness? So, when we are talking about demand, we say willingness and ability. Are you able to pay at a given price? Now, this one takes you back to willingness and the ability. The price of a soda is 2000 I'm thirsty and I want to take soda. It is 2,000 shillings. I'm willing because I'm thirsty. But I don't have the 2,000. I'm not able. Why? Because of the given price. Meaning that my willingness is already there. If I have the 1,000 in the pocket and it is 1,000, a bottle is 1,000, then I'm able to buy at given this price. So now we have two prices measuring these aspects. One, you have 5,000 in your pocket and you are thirsty, you need to drink. A bottle of soda is 2,000. Now, if it is 2,000, the willingness is there because you are thirsty. The ability is there because you have 5,000. But at that price, the willingness goes down. The ability is there, but the willingness has been now determined by the given price. If it is 2,000, 
I buy a bottle and I remain with this and it will not be enough for my transport. And takes you back to introduction, choice, scarcity. Money is not enough. You need to have this all fulfilled to have what we call demand. The bottle is 2000 and you have 5000 in your pocket, but it has other things that you need to buy. So now, at this given price of 2000 you are willing in a single stone. The ability is there because you have 5000 You are able. But your willingness is now determined by the price for that commodity. And that is at a given time. Why do we mention given time? When it is a time for a sports event, for example, World Cup, you may have these key or these topies, the cups. For World Cup, they have players and so on. Now, people who are football fans, he has his 5,000. He is willing. He has the willingness to buy that cup. He has the ability because he has his 5,000 in the pocket. And at a given price of that cup, which is 4,000, it may be very expensive, but because the given price is 4,000, but at that given time of the World Cup event, he is willing to buy and is able at that price. But let the World Cup end. The demand has been there. People are buying cups at 4,000. And there are those who are looking around and say, ah, the cup which is 1,000, they are buying it 4,000. Yes, and the people are buying, even those you call poor, even those you call uh, uh, people who have low income, they are all buying at that time when it is World Cup event. So at that time, there is a very high demand, which I would say, very high demand. People are willing. People are able, people are looking at that price, they don't mind, they buy the first at the first hour. People are, are, are ready to spend that money at that time. But when World Cup ends, you are going to look at people, even the rich people say, a cup is for thousand. For what? He's no longer willing. Why? Time has changed. So he's able, he has the money. The price is, has remained the same. But it's no longer willingness because the time has changed. It is no longer an event. World Cup has ended. When it comes to Christmas time, you realize that Christmas time, people are buying Christmas cards. They, they are buying these Christmas lights. Cards are selling, say, at 10,000 each card. And the people are willing to buy them at 10,000. Let Christmas end. Even if you lower the price to 2000 people will not be willing. Even if they are able, they will not be willing because the time has gone. So these three, I mean, four aspects are very important in determining what we call demand. And so when you are talking about demand, we are in your uh, understanding and emphasis, these terminologies must appear in your definition, refers to the amount of commodities a consumer is willing and able to buy or to purchase at a given price at in a given time. All these existing, there is demand. If one of them is not there, then the demand will be affected. Either it will be low or it will be high. If there is no balancing of this, that your willingness, your willingness may not be there. Completely. People are not willing. People are not willing to purchase a commodity. People have the ability. They are rich. I think you have been in some places where it's a, a, an area of rich people. But these people are not buying. Bananas, mevu, 
at a very low price. Very low price. They are not buying. Why? They are not willing. They have the ability. They are rich. They have the money. But they are not willing. They are not interested. Why are they not willing? It may be culture. It may be education. It may be customs or traditions. It may be uh, so many factors. Religion. So many factors will determine the willingness. So when you talk of demand, demand must have these four in place. And when you are defining demand, make sure you put it, you make a statement that explains or clearly brings out these four. Willingness, ability, given price, given time. The moment you have those four, then in economics we say, there is demand. And if I'm an investor, I say, I want to bring these commodities to your area. But is there demand? Now, when you're talking about is there demand, you're talking about these four, and especially these three. But all are important. At this time, if I sell my products at 10,000 each, are people able? Yes, they are able. They have the money. Are they willing? They are able. Are they willing? They might be there. They might have the ability, but not willing. They may be willing, but not able. Why are they not able? Given price is high. So, you have to increase the price or reduce the price. Play around with the price. That's what we call price theory. Run around with the price, it will bring in these. They will be willing, they will, get, they will be able, and at that particular time. Time comes in because consumers, the consumers, they change their behavior over time. That's why I think in the introduction, we talked about, you must have talked about economics as a social science. It operates in society and it must look at the behavior of individuals. It does not operate in the forest or at a lake or in buildings. The behavior of individuals, these individuals have behavior and their behavior change over time. What you are willing to buy now changes, circumstances change it. That's why it is very important to talk about at a given time. If you went to a place and there was very much demand for certain commodity, ask yourself, why are they demanding this thing? So if, it, if I go and bring these things and sell here, I think I'll get a lot of money. Somebody will give, some, even if it's not an economist, you say, no, it's because you have come in June. But if you come in November, nobody will be buying but in June, you see they have their cultural practices. And everybody goes for those cultural practices. So they are buying those things. That is at a given time. That means in November, the demand will not be there. The demand will not be seen. That's why it is important to make sure that the four must be there. And in your definition, in whatever style, in whatever uh, way you are going to present it, it must have clear presentation of these four. Willingness, ability, given price, given time. That is what we call demand. Now this demand has a law. What is what we call a demand law. From demand law, we get what we call demand and from demand shape we get what we call demand curve. So that's how demand is. If I've known what demand is, we have defined what it is. It has a law which we are going to state. Then from the law, we develop what we call the, the 
demand set. Then from the demand set, we draw a demand curve. So this is how it moves. We begin by defining what demand is. Then after demanding, uh, uh, defining what demand is, we draw or we tabulate a demand shape and then we get the demand curve. So we can have the demand law. The demand law states that the demand law states that putting other factors constant. This is the how the demand law is. Keeping other factors constant, keeping other factors constant is a Latin word. We don't belong to Latin, so you can pronounce it in any way you want, but it is certes paribus. Keeping other, this, this Latin word means keeping other factors constant. So the law says when you keep other factors constant, and we are going to look at which other factors, if you keep other factors constant, the higher the price, the lower the demand. The lower the price, the higher the demand. So, ceteris paribus, uh, that is a Latin word, but it means keeping other factors constant. So the manual says keeping other factors constant the higher the price the lower And the lower the price, the higher that is the demand low. Keeping other factors constant, other factors constant, this is very important. Keeping other factors constant, when the price is high, the demand will be low. When the price is low, the demand will be high. That is the demand low. And it is what we follow. And as I already mentioned or explained it earlier, that when you go to the market and you find prices low, where you needed to buy 5 kilograms, you end up buying 10, 15, because you have found the price low. So, that is what we call the demand low. The ten is very close, that is keeping other factors constant. The higher the price, the lower the demand. And the lower the price, the higher the demand. Some students or some scholars would wish to summarize, to move in a brief, once they reach here, they say, keeping other factors constant, the higher the price, the lower the demand, and vice versa. To save all this, either you are saving ink or time, but the moment you don't state it like this, then it is not a demand law. It is as if you are telling the one reading that stop and think of the reverse, the vice versa, and that is the truth of the law. No, the law is stated in full. The law says keeping other factors constant. Like which factors? Those are the factors that we are going to look at very soon. But just to mention a bit of them. Eight. Operation. Income. These are other factors. They are not only these. There are many. 
the age of the person. But if we keep the age constant that we are looking at only the youth, we are looking at only the old people, if we keep it constant that this area has old people, then the councils will be having high demand. If we look at if we look at the uh, we look at the age, if we look at the income of the people, if we look at the income of the people, what income do these people have? Is it fluctuating? Are some rich, others poor, others very poor? We look at it. Are they poor or are they all rich? So keeping other factors constant, the income, the age, population of the area, they are all constant. Keep the price high, demand will be low. Keep the price low, demand will be high. So that is the demand law. That is what we call the demand law. And this demand law is going to be the basis of doing most of these things. So, keeping other factors constant, the higher the price, the lower the demand, and the lower the price, the higher the demand. That is what we call the demand law. That's what we call the demand law. Then from the demand law, we develop what we call the demand schedule. Now, what is a demand schedule? In a brief definition, we say it is the mathematical representation of the demand law. A demand schedule is a mathematical representation. It is a mathematical representation of the demand law. We have already known what the demand law says. The higher the price, the lower the demand. The lower the price, the higher the demand. So when you come to the shape, the demand shape, it is a mathematical. Sometimes they say it is a tabular representation of the demand law. When you want to present the demand law in terms of figures, then we get what we call the demand schedule. And this is what we are likely to have as demand schedule. This is the demand schedule for sugar. So this is the demand schedule for demand demand schedule for sugar. This is the demand schedule for sugar. So here we say kilograms. No, I think we begin with price. The price kilograms. So we are saying when the price is 100 the willingness to buy, someone will buy uh, 5 kilograms. When it goes to 200 shillings, you will buy, say, 9 kilograms. When it is 300, you may buy uh, 15 kilograms. When it is 400,
hundred you may buy twenty kilograms. And when it is five hundred, you may buy twenty five kilograms. <coughs> what does it show? That as the price sorry. It is supposed to be twenty supposed to be uh, this is twenty five. 15 you can get 10 here <coughs> and and 5 5 here so when the price is 100 shillings the demand is going to be 35 kilograms that the demand shape it is representing the demand law it's a reflection of the demand law. The demand law says the higher the price, the lower the demand. The lower the price, the higher the demand. Keeping other factors constant. Hey, don't, don't forget that one. Keeping other factors constant. When is 100 shillings per kilo? This is 25 kilograms about. If it is 200, they reduce. When you go to 300, they reduce. 400, they reduce. Five. Possibly the time may come when it is even zero. That one means that nobody is willing. So there is no demand and there is nothing that you are representing. That's why we say we don't indicate zero. The demand curve will never touch zero. Why? Because the moment there is no demand, Anything demanded, then there is no demand and nothing you are representing. So you cannot say at a zero price. When in the definition you said at a given price. So there is no there is no price when it is zero. Then what are you representing? And that's why the demand curve will never touch the zero line. It will never be at zero. Because there is no demand and there is no need to talk about it because it is not there. There is no nothing like that. Demand. So this is what we call the demand shape. It is a mathematical representation of the demand law. When you want to show us the demand law, this is exactly what the demand law stated. That keeping other factors constant, the lower the price, the higher the demand. The higher the price, the lower the demand. The lower the price, the higher the demand. The higher the price, the lower the demand. So that's what we call the demand law. You have represented it in a tabular form, in figures. The law, we stated it in words. Now we have represented it in figures. And these are the figures of who? The demand law. So demand schedule for sugar is actually illustrating the demand law in a tabular form. Yes, now we go to the third part, that is the demand curve. The demand curve, what is the demand curve? Remember we stated the law. Those who are doing sciences, they want to look at figures, we have presented the law in figures, in tabular form. Then now, there are those who are not uh, scientists to look at figures, for them they are interested in diagrams. So we present the law in a diagram. And how do we define the demand curve? The demand curve is a demand curve we say it is an illustration. It is a diagrammatical illustration of the demand law. The other is mathematical representation. This one is a diagrammatical representation of the demand law. What you are looking at is the law. So the diagrammatical representation, usually we represent it by drawing the y-axis and the x-axis. And here, on the y-axis, we put price. We are going to represent price. And on the 
x axis you are going to represent quantity quantity that is in terms of kilograms that's what that's what we have whenever we are drawing this we must put a zero here starting with the original if you don't put a zero on the original point then it is not a right uh, diagram so in economics whenever you are drawing these curves you must make sure that the x axis starts from zero even the y the x axis starts from zero and even the y so there must be the origin now we start um, if we get that here, Our demand schedule. Our demand schedule had it to, I mean, five points. I think those are the ones. On the kilograms, we had the five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five. That's what we had. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five. And here we had. 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. That's what we had in our demand schedule. Our demand schedule, this is what we had. That if you look at what quantity and what price. So when it was five, when it was five, we had when it was 500, I mean, if I do, yes, 500, we were buying, the consumer was buying only 5 kilograms. When it was 4, the consumer was buying 10. And when it was 3, it was buying 15. And when it was 200, it was buying 20. When it was 100, it was buying. So now we. This is 10, this is this, this is this, this one has to come a bit here, and this one goes here. So, now we join these points into one line, and this is what we are going to see. Now we have drawn the demand curve. So, we put D here and D here to indicate that it is a a demand curve. If you want, you can put this here and do this. That is the demand curve. And so you say this is a demand curve, and you say. expression of the demand curve for sugar. That is the example we gave. The expression of the demand curve for sugar. That is the diagram that we have, we have, we have drawn. So demand, is it is showing us that the demand is higher when the price is low. The demand is low. So, so is, 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 the demand is, is higher. So it's here. The demand is high when the price is low. And the demand is little when the price is very high. The consumer is willing to buy only 5 kilograms of sugar if the price is at 500. I mean, uh, yes, it is at 500 each kilo. The moment you say no, it is a hundred, he's happy in the market, he buys more kilograms. And that is the demand row. So when you look at this, the demand row, the demand schedule, and the demand curve. Demand row, we have stated it, it is the row put in words, expressed in words. Demand schedule is the row 
demanding of expressed in figures and the demand curve is a demand law expressed in a diagram with a curve. So, those who are happy with the diagrams, that's what they will see. Those who feel figures are better, they will have the, uh, the, 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 the tabula, the, 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 the schedule, tabular presentation of the demand law. So, that's what we have uh, with the, the demand. We have looked at price theory, which has pushed us to a demand level. And I told you, once we are looking at this price theory, we are looking at the demand of the consumer, and then the supply, how much the suppliers can bring on the market. All that is rotating around the price. The supplier is going to look at the price. What is the price of the commodity? What is the price of the commodity? And that price of the commodity will determine how much he's going to put on the market. How much is he going to put on the market? That is the price. Demand. The price, the, the, the consumer is again looking at it. The, the consumer is looking at and say, yes, the consumer is looking at the price to know how much he's going to demand. So price is very important. It plays both on the supply side and the demand side. Where the supply is the producer. Where the, 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 the demand is the consumer. So, that's how far we have come. With the, how far we have come with the demand, uh, demand curve and the, the theory of price. I will not get tired of expressing the fact that price theory is a very, very important topic. The moment you miss out understanding it, then you are going to find problems in all these other topics. For example, when you come to unemployment, why is there unemployment? Jobs are not there. Why are they not there? Because labor is expensive. The moment you talk of expensive, you're talking about the price of labor. That is the wage and salaries. Why are these people highly demanding? Because their prices are low. So, in labor, in unemployment, in development, in planning, public finance, international trade, everything that you are going to be rotating around will be rotating around uh, price and therefore it is very very important to master this topic and that's why we move very slowly to make sure that every aspect is understood and understood very well if it is not understood very well that means you are going to have problems with other topics now Factors which determine sorry. factors which determine demand. Factors which determine demand. So we are going to look at we are going to look at the factors that determine demand as our next topic. Now we have uh, gone to this level. Factors which determine demand. We are looking at uh, things that will make demand be effective. In other words, what factors are, are, are going to make demand to be in existence? What factors, what will make this consumer consume the commodities or buy the commodities? What factors are looked at which are going to compel 
to tell this person buy the commodities or to have demand for a commodity in a certain area. You as an economist, when you go to an area, what factors will you look at to know that there is demand here? Remember, we said keeping other factors constant. Which other factors which we, we are keeping constant? Because that demand law is emphasizing only the price. That keeping other factors constant, the higher the price, the lower the demand. Now we are looking at other factors that will affect the demand even if the price is good, even if the price is bad. So those are the other factors. So in the demand law where we say keeping other factors constant, the higher the price, the lower the demand. The lower the price, the higher the demand. We are now saying which are those other factors that we are keeping constant that may affect demand. And these are the ones which we are looking at. Now when we are talk talking about these factors that determine demand, we begin with the one which is in the law. And that is the price. So number one is the price. Price of a commodity. Price of the commodity. Commodity. Remember, we said that the commodity is goods and services. So, if it's the price of a service, it's a commodity. The price of a good is a commodity. But here, when we say price of a commodity, we have combined goods and services. So, the price of the commodity, the price of the commodity which is in equation, will determine the demand. And here the explanation is very easy. The price of the commodity, and this follows the demand law. That is the higher the price, the higher, the lower the demand. So this one, you state the demand law as it is. When you put this point there, put there, you will start with it. You say price of the commodity. You just say this follows the demand law, which says the higher the price, the lower the demand. The lower the price, the higher the demand. That is number one. Number two, when you look at the price of the commodity, the next is uh, the consumer uh, preference. The preference of the consumer. The consumer has preferences. What I demand or what I prefer may be different from what the other one prefers. If it is a group of people, what this group prefers may differ from what the other group prefers. So, the consumer's preference, what do consumers prefer in terms of commodity? So, you say consumer preference. Consumer preferences. What do consumers prefer? What do they want? That is the preference we are talking about. What do they want? Preference has a lot of other factors that determines it. But what are they preferring? Do they prefer your commodity? A preference may be size, color, shape, what, taste. And whatever, what are they prefer? That is the very, very important in determining the consumer's preferences. Sometimes we even combine it with the preferences and the tests. But when the consumer's preferences and tests are positive, the demand will be high. So the moment these consumers prefer or they have positive tests, over your commodity, the demand is going to be high. So the consumer's preferences and tests in the area or as individual, what do they prefer? This goes with even fashions. If today we are selling dresses which are very long 
That's not what prefer, uh, the, the, the consumers prefer. So a shop selling long dresses which go up to mob to, to bottom may have very low demand. Why? It is not what the consumers prefer. The consumers who are buying those dresses prefer short ones, slitted ones, tight ones. So you sell these round, long dresses, they will not buy because that's not their tastes. That's not their preference. That's not what they want. So when the preferences are positive, the demand is going to be high. When the preferences and tests are negative, then the demand for that commodity or for those commodities is going to be low. So that is the other factor. And that, those are the factors. We keep constant that the preferences are constant. Tests are constant. Once those are constant, price is high, demand is going to be low. But here we're saying, the moment the preferences are positive, the demand is going to be very high. You go to these urban areas and good shops selling fashionable uh, dresses, trousers, shirts, you'll find them selling, people are packed. Everybody is demanding that, everybody is buying that. And those who are selling these long, white, traditional dresses, they are not selling. The demand is zero. Why? Because of tests and preferences. What do they want? What is the market demanding? What do they prefer? What is their test? That's why if you are a producer, if you are a producer, you have to be constantly watching the market. What is most demanded now? What do people want? Do they want to move by buses? The demand for buses will be high. Do they want to move by taxis? The demand for taxis will be high. So you have to keep on studying the preferences of the consumers. The moment you don't do that and you are an economist, that means you are going to have your commodities not bought. Or the demand is going to be low. So the second factor that determines demand is the consumer preference. It is very, very important to look at it. Then three, the seasons. The seasons. The seasons. The seasons. Or we say seasonal factors. Seasonal factors. There are commodities that are bought, I mentioned it earlier, which are bought in given seasons that you may not have much to do with them if the season is not on. The example I gave was about a World Cup. But I think the most common ones are these international events days or seasonal days. Christmas. If it is Christmas season, or coming to Christmas season, November, December, there are items that have very high demand because of the season. There's music that is being bought on flashes, on CDs, and so on because of the season. And when the season ends, the demand goes down. So the season factors are very important in determining the demand for the commodity. If the season is on, you find a very high demand for those commodities. There are countries, I think even in Uganda, the same thing. There is a period when universities are graduating. One university after the other, one after the other, they are graduating. The demand for gowns is very high. Demand for graduation cakes, graduation decorations, all these are very, the demand is very high at that time, in that season. When the season goes and there are no graduation ceremonies, then the demand for those gowns will go down. So the seasonal factors are very important in determining the demand. And those are the ones we keep constant, that they are constant. Otherwise, if they are not constant, during the time of the season, we are going to see it ahead. During the time of the season of graduation,
During the time of the season of Christmas, the prices tend to be high and people disobey the law. They are going to disobey the law. And when you are an economist, you read the, the law and say the higher the price, the lower the demand. The season comes. It is Christmas. You find that people are buying in need. Right now, it's not Christmas season. The kilo is say 15,000. And people are buying what is enough. But when it comes to Christmas time, you're going to see people buying. Even if it goes to 25. Someone who has been buying one kilogram. Christmas season say, 25, give me four kilograms. Say, hey, what about the demand law? The seasonal factors determine the demand. And those are the ones who have to keep constant that there are no seasons that will affect that law. The moment you don't do that, then we say no. When it is Christmas time, prices are high and demand is very high. So that is it, what we call seasonal factors. They determine, they determine so much the, uh, the demand. Once the season is on, definitely by all means, you are going to have high demand during the peak seasons, the ceremonial seasons. There is nothing that you can do. It's a season for campaigns. The t-shirts for the t-shirts for these people campaigning are going to be very. The, the, the demand is going to be very high, and the prices will go up. A campaign shirt, you will find that it is sold at thirty thousand, and people are buying because it's a season. When it ends, the demand will go down. So seasonal factors are very very important in determining the price of the commodities. Then we have the income distribution. Income distribution. That's another factor. And we say fair income distribution increases demand. And unfair income distribution reduces the demand for the commodity or commodities. When the income, uh, the, the, the income of the area, people are rich, people have money, you find them buying more. When the income is low for certain people in the same in, in that area, that the income is not enough, they don't have enough income, then you are going to find a big problem with the, with the, the demand. The moment you have the low incomes, the demand is going to be low. So when you are going to an area, you are going to sell your commodities. You have to find out how is the income distribution of these, these people in the area. Is it favorable? Can it create demand if the distribution is low? Then you are going to have you're going to have low demand. 